Bitcoin has remained immutable since day one when it came to the you know consensus rules of the protocol itself. It hasn't changed. Um, it's always stayed the same, 21 million. And we have the halving coming up. And the halving is just a perfect example of this programmable monetary problem. Uh, policy that hasn't changed because I think Bitcoin is properly decentralized. And so there's a lot of debate over this having, over what the price is going to do, what it means, what's going to happen to miners. Maybe we can just, uh, you know, tackle that topic and, and get your main uh, takeaways for what you expect to happen. I, mean, I think it's a couple of days away now. Yeah, looking at Saturday, I think, is the latest estimate. So um, very close. And then yeah. obviously the big question is what happens to price or also maybe what happens to miners. And we've written two separate pieces on this. Our analyst, Daniel Gray, wrote one last year already just on the halving itself and some of the price performance in the past halvings. And then our most recent piece was more of it from a miner's perspective. And we actually had a webinar with Fred Thiel, CEO of Marathon, the one of the largest publicly traded mining companies. And... I think one of the biggest things just to get out of the way is this is obviously bad for miners as a whole. The revenue gets cut in half, at least in terms of Bitcoin terms. Um, some of these will have to, some of these miners will have to shut down. And I don't know if they're all some of the publicly traded ones, but that's just kind of the math of it. It reminds me of if you pull people and they say how good of a driver you are, everyone says they're above average. Well, that mathematically can't be true. <laughs> Not everyone <laughs> is above average. Not every miner is going to be able to survive the having, but from an investor's perspective, that doesn't matter because uh, we've seen hash rate drop with each having event. Um, but the the more recent ones, the drop is sometimes as extreme, but it's taken fewer and fewer days. And we have this in our research report, how many days it takes to recover from that drop in hash rate. And I think the last one was, was a week or, or maybe a little bit over, whereas before it was maybe 30 days. So still even not that long, but the network will continue to operate as normal. And then on the price side, what people are interested in, of course, is how big of an effect does this cut in newly incoming supply have? And of course, there's a lot of debate about this, and I don't pretend to have the answers, but um, I was always told in finance never to say the four most dangerous words, this time is different. <laughs> Although factually, this time is different in that we have an all-time high before the halving. Yeah. And of course, a lot of that, I think, can be contributed to the approval of the ETPs. So we've seen massive demand. It's not just demand from people anticipating the halving. But if you look at, and this is something I've been following, if you look at Google search trends, the last halving, it's just flat, spike on the week and flat. It's like the halving came and went in a couple days and it got a, a little bit of press and that was it. Some people Googled it. Now you've got the term Bitcoin halving, if you type that into Google trends, moving up well over a month, month and a half, two months before the halving. And it's still moving up. And I expect it to spike, of course, the rest of this week and into next week, uh, and then it will come back down. And so more people are aware of it this time and more people, I think this creates a bit of a reflexivity where more yeah. people are, are getting aware of Bitcoin, maybe first from the all-time new high, and then they Google Bitcoin and then they find out, oh, there's a halving coming soon as well. And then maybe that induces them to buy and then moves price up again and, and it repeats. So you've got some reflexivity going on there. In the short term, I don't know as anyone else does what's going to happen. Obviously, we've had big drops before the halving. We've had big drops after the halving in the past. Long term, though, I am in the camp where I don't think this is fully priced in. And that's because you're taking off a big chunk of supply. And, and Bitcoin, at the end of the day, is something that's traded based on simple economics of supply and demand. I think it was Lynn Alden or someone on Twitter said, uh, imagine a whale coming in on just a certain date and all of a sudden just buying 450 coins per day, indiscriminate of price. That's what's gonna, gonna happen here. The big question to me is whether or not that supply that's taken off is filled in or even more than filled in with new supply coming in from long-term holders. Because right now in the data, we're seeing that with the rally, long-term holders are finally starting to move their coins. Yep. So late last year into this year, we had a new, once again, this time is different, a new all-time high in coins not moved in over a year at 70%. And now that's coming back down and you see the short-term holders piling in. And so to connect this back to the, the ETPs, this might not be as popular with the bulls, but in the short term, I think you could see a lot more volatility because we don't know who these, these holders are, the ETPs or the buyers, but given the volume that we've seen and the flows, I have to suspect it's, it's, it's more speculative short-term trading or some people just looking for exposure. And this is going to be their first cycle, right? 
And so if we do get a drawdown, there could be some reflexivity there as well, where a lot of these new players, and you see this in the on-chain data, short-term holders driven by ETPs, these new players are, are going to get shaken out. Um, again, that's a short-term trend though, but long-term, I think the halving and the, the demand from the ETPs is, is a very positive thing over the next 12 plus months. Yeah, I, I think we were talking about that recently, the the coins, the supply held by, for one plus year, I think it's at like 65% now off its all-time high of 70. So it's come down. And then I think uh, I think somebody over at Bitwise was talking about how he thinks most of the flows have actually been more retail into these ETPs instead of institutional because they just take longer to kind of make investment decisions and they need time. A lot of these wirehouses need time to offer it and it's not fully accessible and integrated yet. Um, and so he thinks a lot of it are retail. So he could be right. It could be more speculative traders, retail traders kind of coming in. Maybe they're trading this event. Maybe it is going to be this like a very volatile event that gets traded. I could totally see that. But then long term, I agree with you. It is. Yeah, the, think, it, think about yeah. like the someone who's really bought into the thesis of Bitcoin, of what we're talking about, ultimate store of value, emerging monetary good. If they were that convicted, they would have gotten exposure some other way, at least I think, in my opinion. If you've got convention, you're going to find a way to get exposure. And there was plenty of easy ways to get exposure before the ETPs. And, you know, it requires maybe an extra account opening somewhere, name your, your place, but you could have done it, right? It's not like, oh, this is now the only way they got it. And now they finally got exposure to this. The, yeah. the only way I could think of someone buying them with that conviction would be in certain accounts like 401ks IRA or IRAs accounts, or something yeah. like that. Yeah, where they couldn't get spot exposure and now they can get it through through those products. But this having is very notable too because it's it's actually when Bitcoin's going to become scarcer than gold uh, from a stock to flow ratio, which I think is notable. I mean, people have been talking about it for a long time, but it's where the uh, you know the annual growth rate of Bitcoin supply is going to go from about 1.7 uh, to 0.85%, 85 bips a year. And gold, I think, hovers around like 1.5 to 1.6 in terms of its annual growth rate. And so what do you think about that? Do you think that's notable? I think from like a narrative standpoint, it could be uh, something that people latch on to. There might be an article or two written about it, but what do you think? Yeah, you would think people would be extrapolating this and seeing this coming, right? Because it's very known in advance. And you and we've run the calculations on our reports as well, comparing it to gold. And gold has a pretty steady uh, stock to flow and, and what's mined every year. So it will continually get higher and higher than gold. And I, I agree with you. I think that is a point for people to say. I, I do wonder, though, if that would really push people over the edge, though. You know, if they're a gold yeah. bug or they're interested in gold, it's, well, now Bitcoin's slightly more scarce or has a higher stock to flow than gold. Is that really gonna, going to move them? Um, yeah. My personal opinion is probably not, but we'll see. How, like, there's been so much debate over the having about, you know, it seems like prior halvings, there's been a lot of uh, confluence of events where people are kind of attributing the price increases to the having, but there's also macro factors that seem to happen in like 2016, 2020. Hurley, if maybe you could throw that chart up of a central bank balance sheet lined up with the halvings. I thought this was a fantastic chart you guys put out um, last year, but it just kind of shows the central bank balance sheet growth right around the prior halvings and seeing that you know it was a pretty uh, supportive time for asset prices, I would say, during those periods. How much of, of you know prior historical price movements would you attribute to actually the halving? You know, I guess it's this idea of... Um, is it actually a driver here or, or would you say the macro environment is and also like a key, key factor? Yeah, this is the hardest question for us on the research team because we have no counterfactual. We don't yeah. we don't have a lab where we can run the experiment again. We can only look back at history. And unfortunately, we can't disentangle these two things, uh, the supply side going on, getting cut in half. But on the other hand, you've got more liquidity and potential more demand, especially with the last one in 2020. Of course, nobody saw some of the pandemic and COVID stuff hit, hitting. So you had this massive demand. And what also coincided with that was a, a huge increase in inflation expectations. And one of the charts I love to look at is year over year change in inflation expectations, which remember, you're taking a, a percentage change on a percent level. But because you're talking about inflation as a level, I think it is valid to do that. If, if the 
expected inflation goes from 3% a year to 6% a year, that's a doubling of your inflation expectations. So you chart that and you chart that with the year over year change of Bitcoin. And they look like two exact spikes over the exact same time period. And similar to these charts as well. The other one we routinely run is just liquidity. So if you look at your year change in M2, broad money supply of all the major economies in the world, US, Japan, uh, Eurozone, UK, you can even throw in like Australia and some of these other countries, but it's the same thing. Digital assets, Bitcoin particular follows the year over year change in M2. And so I personally think, you know, it is just correlation. I personally think there's theoretical backing and evidence for this of why it would make sense, or at least kind of a sound theory. And um, even if some people deny it or don't believe it, that doesn't mean the market as a whole is is smarter than the sum of its parts. And that's a phenomenon we've we've explored and, and academic literature has explored for a long time. And so I think it is correctly reflecting and having a forward look at these at these changes in liquidity, changes in monetary conditions, changes in inflation expectations. And the, the one that we wrote about in our last 2024 look ahead piece that we published in January, and I've been seeing it circling around in various forms, I think you tweeted it and other people, which is some form of either the 10 year yield, we use the, the real interest rate plotted against Bitcoin. As real rates got lower and lower and lower and even went negative, Bitcoin rallied. Makes yeah. sense. It's non cash flowing. Investing is a relative game. Are you going to hold a bond to maturity and ensure that you get a negative return? Or are you going to go to something like Bitcoin? But then as the Fed ratcheted rates at one of the fastest paces in history, real rates got higher and higher. Inflation came down. Bitcoin did poorly. That also makes sense. The, the interesting thing was when these two diverged in 2023 and are still diverging with Bitcoin yeah. rallying and rates staying high and inflation still staying relatively low. Um, what's going on here? Is, is the model broken? Maybe. Uh, do one of these things need to correct, aka Bitcoin go down? Maybe. I'm in the camp that because gold is doing the exact same thing and we're getting new highs in gold, it's sniffing something else out on the macro front. It's sniffing out these structural fiscal imbalances. It's sniffing out maybe a change in liquidity. Um, whatever it may be, I think it is more forward looking than what most people are, are giving it giving it credit for. Yeah, I did tweet that. I, I think that's some of the most interesting charts in the markets right now. And whether we are going to see reversion to the mean there or they are sniffing out this, you know, either the fiscal situation or, you know, the other thought I had is just, you know, the Fed could maybe use other tools that they have at their disposal that inadvertently lead to more inflationary pressures without touching, you know, the short end, you know, rates. Um, yeah, so we have all these other things to keep yeah. track of. I'm losing track of like the reverse repo. Exactly. Um, yeah. the, the TGP. A, whatever it's called, like the Treasury General account and all these things that are influencing liquidity. It's hard to get a, a measure of what's real liquidity and money supply out there nowadays. Exactly. Yeah. And so the, perhaps like, you know, that divergence is because of that. You know, it's taking into account all these different. They even say they have more surgical tools to handle, uh, you know, uh, financial instability problems or you know issues at the Treasury market, you know, and that all this leads to increased liquidity in one way or another. And, and gold and Bitcoin might be reflecting that. But the one thing with the having that I want to talk about, and like it's something that I believe in. Like I, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think perhaps the supply dynamics are a bit overblown because with each uh, successive having, its impact on the total, like say daily trading volume, is reduced. And so, um, Hurley, if you could throw that chart up, I, I, Nidig had this chart on um, the having's uh, supply reduction becoming less important over time. And I think it makes a lot of sense. I mean, what, what they're showing here is, you know, with the with the current halving that's about to happen, it's it's going to be about a reduction of only 49 basis points of the daily exchange volume because it basically translates to 31 million per day at 70,000 price of Bitcoin. It's about 59 basis points of the daily exchange volume, whereas maybe the first halving, that was about 10.6% of trading volumes at the time. And so it had a much more pronounced impact compared to the current situation. And so NIDIG's big takeaway was they still think, you know, the demand side of things are going to be the main driver. I mean, primarily around these new ETF products uh, being so popular and the inflows into them. They think like heading into this year, it's not so much about the supply side with the having it's really the demand side that's going to be the primary driver. So what do you say to that chart and, and maybe that idea? Because honestly, I think I agree with them. Yeah, I haven't seen that chart. That's interesting. I 
I think that makes sense. You you've got a smaller and smaller impact. The I'm just trying to kind of reason through this in my head. I do think that the demand is going to be the bigger factor here. And if you're thinking of trading volume versus, I'm just thinking of of actual supply of coins. Is that different? So mm -hmm. there could be a lot of trading volume of speculators trading back and forth. And those are all kind of the people in the same camp, the, the speculators, the, the tourists, the people who are, are just going back and forth looking for momentum trades versus one of the stats we've been watching closely is the number of coins on exchanges continues to go down. So yeah. we saw this post FTX. We're now down over 30% uh, in terms of from the all time high on exchanges. We have 30% fewer coins, not dollar amount, but native coins. And that continues to trend lower. It was even down another 5% year to date in the first quarter of this year. And so what happens if, as these demand things kind of go, as, as we get more out to that longer curve that we were talking about earlier of everyone taking a core small position, uh, it gets ramped into RIA platforms, people do their due diligence. Like it, these products are still stuck in compliance for a lot of firms. So what happens when that demand side ramps up and those are people looking to hold for the long term and they go out to buy coins for the long term, not just trade them. And there's fewer and fewer available on exchanges or just fewer and fewer available in the supply because a lot of people have locked these up in cold storage for a year. I think that's one of the things that could could maybe counter that. Uh, that yeah. Trend.